Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're here ready to get started. So I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, so welcome and thank you for being here. We're here today to present the people's demands for a just recovery from flooding, which were developed by grassroots organizations on the front lines of flood relief in the weeks since the year's flooding. My name is Sister Sankofa, and I'm co-director of Community Resilience Organizations, or CROWS, as you affectionately know us, which emerged after Hurricane Irene in 2011 and has been committed for over a decade to the work of building community resilience from within. We are a grassroots organizing hub and provide technical assistance to grassroots workers and towns working at the intersection of racial and climate justice. Since the July 11 floods this year, there's been even more devastating floods, flooding in St. Johnsbury and Linden just two days ago. These floods are not over, even when the water recedes. It is past time to listen to the people on the front lines of this crisis and act accordingly. Today, we will hear from six people from across central and northern Vermont, all places hit with flooding last year and this year. They'll share their stories and talk about the urgent need for just recovery, a recovery that goes beyond repairing flood damage to address underlying inequities. We know that investing in... Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. So we know that investing in this work will not only make it possible to rebuild from now recurring flooding, but will set our communities up for a safe, thriving future as the climate crisis continues to unfold. So let's get to it. Um, first, we're going to start with hearing from Audrey Grant from Nico, who will read the demands. Hello everyone, my name is Audrey Grant. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Northeast Kingdom Organizing, um, one of the organizations leading um, flood relief um, in the Northeast Kingdom. Here are the people's demands for a just flood recovery. Grassroots organizations and community mutual aid groups are the first to mobilize when disaster strikes, drawing on relationships, local knowledge, and that combination of grit and care that makes us Vermonters. In the time of of ever unfolding disaster, we recognize the need, need to balance short-term needs and long-term transformation. As informed by our identity, identities, lived experiences, and expertise, we demand that the state of Vermont deliver on key pillars of a just recovery, recovery that goes beyond repairing flood damage to address underlying Investing in this work will not only make it possible to rebuild from now recurring flooding, but will set our communities up for a safe, thriving future as the climate crisis continues to unfold. The first pillar is housing. Create anti-displacement policies and local emergency housing plans. Vermonters have the right to remain in their towns and neighborhoods as the changing climate increases the frequency of disasters and the loss of housing for poor and working class people. Avoiding displacement increases resilience, health, and capacity of small towns. Create local emergency housing plans that guarantee people will not be displaced in disasters and enact policies that protect people from the unjust removal from their homes. Invest in housing construction and repair. Build affordable, climate resilient housing for current and future Vermonters. New housing development will offset the loss of flood impacted buildings and tax base. Tax high earners and second homeowners and invest in workforce development that can shorten wait lists for housing repair programs. The next key pillar is administration. Appoint staff to support local emergency preparedness and response. Create permanent positions to respond to the needs of Vermonters impacted by climate fuel disasters like flooding, landslides, heat waves, and more. Add state-supported capacity to implement all stages and functions of climate disaster response, tailored to meet the specific needs of our state's rural population and available to support volunteer emergency responders. 
Invest in emergency management and planning systems. Connect towns with federal funding sources that can be used for emergency planning, such as municipal technical assistance program and community development block grant funds. Support the Vermont Voluntary Organizations and Active Disaster Affiliate to more effectively coordinate volunteers throughout the state. and create innovative funding mechanisms for farms, businesses, and individuals to provide immediate support for after a climate disaster. Climate adaptation. Ecological restoration of floodplain and management of river corridors. Develop watershed-wide river management and ecosystem restoration plans that account for and minimize flood impacts. Adjust statewide development standards and incentivize and incentivize to prevent new building in floodplains and incentivize climate resilient construction. Buy out homeowners who are willing to move. Investment in infrastructure that will withstand climate disaster. Ensure that all new infrastructure is built to withstand flooding and other climate disasters. Invest in roads, wastewater treatment, water systems, and food infrastructure that is reliable under climate stressors and ensures people can meet the basic needs during a crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, next, we're going to have Paige Hartzell from NICO. Good morning. Thanks to everyone for being here under um, really difficult circumstances for so many people. Again, here we are again a year later, 20 days later, and we will be here again. We have to speak to the intimate connection between the wealth gap and the deepening climate disaster. In particular, the anti-displacement policies. We know that people create community wherever they are. We have seen that again and again with people who were hit a year ago and three weeks ago and days ago. It is critical that people be able to stay in the community where they are, to call on connections that they have, to help each other rebuild, to maintain the health and the unity and the connection that they have. That is critical to rebuilding. We also need small towns to be able to access the NTAP funding as soon as disaster strikes, in between disasters, and in answering the disasters of the past that they are still rebuilding from a year later. We need for people not to have to wait days, weeks, months, because we all know that life goes on. Medical bills st still keep coming in. The needs of families do not stop. We need for people to be able to have these funds so that they can rebuild, continue to call on their communities, and continue to create the connections needed to overcome these barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. So important. And so thanks for so much for sharing for what's going on in the kingdom um, and presenting the people's demands. Next, we're going to hear from Prem Linsky, construction manager at Barry Up. Hello, I am Prem Linsky. I work with Barry Up. I'm an independent contractor and have my own business, Hanuman Consulting. We do flood relief work. Um, so I got to work with Megan up and Nico last summer. I ran the All Hands and Hearts disaster recovery with um, Megan Holcomb over there. Uh, we worked out of Cabot. We worked in Plainfield, Marshfield with Michelle, which was a pleasure I can't, I can't express enough. And we worked through Johnson, Barry, and all up uh, through Lamoille Valley, which was really great to be able to do that work last year. And I'm really grateful now to be able to come back and work with Barry up. And I took the job to be leading the rebuild in Barry City. So working with homeowners that ha were displaced, had their house uh, gutted, had their house unlivable, uh, foundation issues, 
um, you know, just rebuilding walls, re-insulating, doing all of that work. So we got about 25 homes worked on in the past six months, months which has been really wonderful since I started the job. Uh, working with Resource and Youth Build to do that, really wonderful organization. Um, and three weeks ago when we hit flooding again, we mobilized incredibly quickly. Um, I, since then, with Barry Up, we did 40 homes mucked in 12 days. Uh, and I attribute that to just a, yeah, super cool. I'm incredibly grateful to be able to say that. And I know I am privileged to be able to have a wonderful team of people around me. Um, the, the morning after the flood, I had resource showing up with pumps, with tools, with supplies. I had um, other teams showing up, meet, met me there, and we just got to work. I, I got to call on friends of mine from from around the state that have also done disaster recovery work for a long time, and and we we got to work, and it was easy, and I understand that Barry City is a very different case than the Northeast Kingdom, and a very different case than Plainfield, and a very different case than every other part in the state. If I forgot a wheelbarrow on a site, it took me five minutes to get one there. If we forgot buckets or Tyvek suits or shovels, I could get them to a site fairly quickly. And I, I just want to say that the, the ruralness of Vermont makes it really difficult to respond to disasters like this. Uh, so while I am grateful that I was able to mobilize quickly and get work done effectively, that is not the case around the state and it's something that needs to be looked at. And I got to pull from seven years of disaster recovery experience and worked with five other people who also all had over five years of disaster recovery experience, all working in Barry City. And I'm incredibly grateful for that, but it's not always the case. And I think that the state needs to unify around this so that we can all share knowledge and work together in, in instances like this. And I wanna talk about water. Um, rain, rain comes down and, and it hits, hits the ground and it can either go into the ground or it can hit the concrete and keep moving fast. Yesterday I was on 2nd Street rebuilding a foundation that collapsed three weeks ago and there was three feet of water rushing down the road next to us while we were pouring concrete, terrified that what was going to happen next um and people were cursing the rain and i had to remind them that the rain is not the problem the the rivers are here doing their job and in a couple hundred years ago before colonization the rivers just flowed they just did their job this was all forest and it wasn't a problem humans came we put concrete up we put houses up and that is part of the problem here and there is a way to live with nature. The indigenous people did it in this land before we were here, and they could teach us a lot today about that. So when we're thinking about like the beavers, we removed all the beavers from the land. The beavers built dams that slowed the water down, and now we're just blowing up their dams, removing them so somebody can put a house on a mountain. And it's things like that. It's that mentality that nature is in our way that got us here. Um, like in Barry City, redirected a river, lined it with granite, and it overflows every time there's an inch of rain. And that is the problem. And, and it, it is important to remember that rain, yes, is coming faster than it was before, but the natural earth has a system for soaking in the rain. You know, a good farmer once taught me the goal here is to stop it, sink it, store it so that you can use it. But when you're putting roads up, the water doesn't have anywhere to go, so it just goes down. And we built homes in floodplains. Barry City in the North End is in a floodplain, and those homes will continue to get flooded until we do some work on the rivers around it and figure out that problem. It's not those homeowners' problem to fix the river. And this is what I say to City Council. It's like, we can't push these problems onto homeowners. The state, the government, needs to do something about it. It needs to do something about it in a way that works with nature, not against it. Dredging the river in Barry City just sends it to Montpelier. I don't wanna see Montpelier get flooded. 
I don't, and if Montpelier did it, it goes to Waterbury. Waterbury does it, it goes to Richmond. And then the Intervale farm gets flooded yet again. You know, it's like everything is downstream from everybody else. And until we can start thinking as a whole state on how we want to work through some of these challenges, we're not going to get there. <clears throat> and FEMA is going to take 10 years to do it. So you can you can go <laughs> through thinking, yeah, I could spend most of my day just mitigating people's expectations of FEMA. But it's going to take forever before they give the money to have it done. So really, people need to organize, step up and and get out there and try to do things themselves and and work with people who are experts. I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to talk about river management. But there are experts in this state that do this work and we should be listening to them. Um, housing is an also, also just like a huge topic that keeps coming up and the biggest thing I've heard from almost every single homeowner that I've worked with, every single flood survivor in Barry City and across the state is they would love to leave the floodplain. They would love to leave the floodplain, go live up on a hill and not have to worry about this stuff again. There is no place to go. There is no housing available in the state that's affordable. The average household income is $72,000 which would maybe afford you $350,000 mortgage for a house. There's not many in that price range that aren't in the floodplain. And that's another huge problem when, when your average Vermonter that's working, that's got a family, cannot afford to compete with somebody coming from out of state to buy a short-term rental, to buy a second home. And I know that that's a huge problem that needs to be looked at. It needs to be addressed. I think putting a 2% tax on short-term rentals and second homes to put towards affordable housing isn't really doing much. It's a Band-Aid. Um, affordable housing isn't affordable anymore. Like we say, like we're talking about like, oh, putting money towards affordable housing. I can't afford affordable housing if I want to continue to do the work I'm doing. It's, it's like, it's a bigger thing that we need to start talking about and there's not enough contractors because too many people told their kids to go get a job at a tech company nobody's teaching kids how to go do construction anymore so there's less contractors out there less carpenters out there and they're going to go work for the jobs that pay more and i don't blame them because they too have families that they're trying to take care of they too are trying to afford the child care in this state that is almost non-existent that's really difficult to come by um, so i think leaning into Training programs, resource is an amazing resource for us. Um, I've been calling on the resource team that does a construction training program to do all of my rebuilds in Barry City. I also work with Youth Build. Youth Build is one of the greatest things that the state has, and I think it's underutilized and underfunded. And it works with high school age youth that have, for some reason or another, are not in their public high school anymore. It wasn't a good fit and it gives them another opportunity to get a diploma and explore the world of working with their hands. And working at that organization was the greatest job I've ever had and it was the greatest thing I've ever been a part of. Um, yep, cool. I just wanna thank you all. I just wanna say get out and volunteer, get out and work with a long-term recovery group get out and help as much as you can and take care of each other. Thank you, Prem, for the report from Barry. Uh, next up, we've got Jenny Belaturskowski, I'm sorry about that, and Jim Gertzman, who live in Plainfield and lost their home in both floods. Thank you, Jenny and Jim. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny Belitzerkowski, and I'm here with my husband, Jim Gersman. Our family of four have lived in Plainfield for 17 years. We are two educators who have lost our home to the July flood this year. In the time we have lived in our home, we had to evacuate four times. We had applied for the FEMA buyout program last year and were denied on a local level. The reason for the denial was that we were not in a floodplain according to FEMA maps. We urge Governor Scott and the legislature to follow up on the immediate need for affordable housing, National Guard deployment with flood recovery, to help with flood recovery, and press FEMA to update their floodplain maps and create a concise, centralized response to natural disasters. 
We call ourselves very lucky that we have had many individuals who had been advocating for us, supporting us, helping us. However, we have to navigate the slow-moving bureaucratic maze of flood recovery while mourning the loss of our home, community, and primary nest egg. We have met and talked countless individuals who are working on the state level to help out as much as they can. We are facing an opaque and unstructured response to a natural disaster. There seems to be no one caseworker or one point of information that can help with a multitude of challenges. We are getting information from individual volunteers, friends, and neighbors. It is all piecemeal. We are getting information, um, we were under the illusion that after last year's natural disaster, Vermont and the federal government had had time to draft a plan for a concerted response. For example, the trash and debris in Plainfield continues to bake in the sun 22 days after the flood. Entire lawns are covered in debris, some of which may be toxic, some of which may be leaking into the groundwater. We have not been able to receive a clear response who will take care of it. We had to spend considerable time and effort finding someone who would empty out our oil tank before it started to leak hundreds of gallons of oil. Not one official person gave us a list with numbers to call or even just thinking about such a crucial component of flood recovery. We urge our govern governor and our vice president to not forget the residents of Plainfield, Vermont. We know that the moment press coverage ceases, our village may fall into obscurity. We ask for an overhaul of FEMA and its antiquated flood maps, an overhaul of its convoluted numbers game when considering the lives and livelihoods of people like us, and a boots on the ground response from a federal and state perspective. Disaster recovery of this magnitude. Excuse me. <laughs> Should not rest on the soldiers of neighbors, shoulders, sorry, on the shoulders of neighbors and friends, or a cash strapped village select board run by volunteers. No one should have to go through what we have to deal with in the richest nation on the planet. This will not be the last time that a Vermont community has to face a natural disaster. However, this should be the last time that a community has to struggle with the immense loss only to navigate gargantuan tasks of flood recovery. We use a colonial term to call ourselves a developed nation. How can we call ourselves developed when we can't have a centralized and efficient response to natural disasters? How can we call ourselves developed when we, like too many people in our community, are one natural disaster away from homelessness? Why haven't we developed an efficient and centralized disaster response when we know what we are now experiencing disasters like these in increasing frequency and severity? Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Jenny and Jim. Thank you for st sharing your story. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Amy Lester, uh, another Plainfield resident here with the Vermont Workers Center, the Nonviolent Medicaid Army, and the Poor People's Campaign. Thank you. And thank you, Jenny, and all the speakers for sharing your stories and experiences with today. And I want to give a shout out to those speakers who couldn't get here today because of the closed roads in the Northeast Kingdom. Megan Whalen and Megan Mather, Math, sorry, Matters were on their way here this morning and couldn't get here. Um, again, I'm Amy Lester, longtime member of the Vermont Worker Center and a, a statewide member-led organization fighting for our human rights to health care, housing, work with dignity, and a member of the nonviolent Medicaid Army, building an army for the poor. I live also a half a city block from ground zero of the Great Brook Flood of 2024. July 10th, all the volunteer rescue, EMT, firefighters, emergency management folks, select board, 
all these hundreds and of people, all volunteers and neighbors came out and did what we do. We take care of each other, literally saving lives. We rescued, we housed, we fed, we provided clean water and rides. And that work is still happening. 100% volunteer, 100% mutual aid. It is now August 1st, 21 days after the July 10th 100 year flood. One year to the day after another 100 year flood. And my small town of 1200 is taking on an estimated cost of $15 million for cleanup. Is it possible for mutual aid to get us out of this mess? We need us and we need the state to step up. We are tired and for my neighbors rebuilding this, this is only the beginning. As Jenny said, where is the coordinated effort to help and assist and coming off of the heels of being of funding being diminished in our quote after COVID time, after 38,000 people have been kicked off of Medicaid in Vermont and housing assistance and rental assistance has, is now depleted. This is what we're facing folks. Now we're expected to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. Our state needs to leverage the wealth that's here. As Jenny pointed out, we are the richest nation in the world, and yet we're not taking care of our citizens. A neighbor almost a week after the flood told me that he had lost his heart medication. It was somewhere under the six feet of silt and sludge in his home. I happen to know his doctor, his primary care physician at the local uh, health center. So I was able to call on a Saturday and he was able to get his prescription called in. A neighbor, another neighbor stepped up and went and got the prescription. Then another neighbor paid that $40 for that prescription. But this is just one story. I just happened to be standing there and we made this happen. But there are a lot of stories like this where people are falling through the cracks. Can you imagine a world where we know all of our neighbors and, and in times of disaster and chaos, we can easily and quickly identify our needs? Then imagine a van or a trailer pulls up in your, on your street or your hill and delivers all the information and support that you need. Your health care, the safety, the housing, the clean water, all of these things could be met. Our experiences highlight and shed light on the cracks in our system. And these cracks, folks, are not accidental. We demand these d demands that were read earlier are met. When the waters rise, so do we. I'm going to say forward together. Could you repeat back? Not one step back. Forward together. Forward together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Next up is Michelle Edelman McCormick, Director of Cooperation Vermont. My name is Michelle Edelman McCormick, and I am the director and lead organizer for Cooperation Vermont, and I'm also the general manager of the worker-owned cooperative at the Marshfield Village Store, which in last year's July flooding ended up being a uh, response hub and coordinating recovery efforts for the town of Marshfield that was cut off for a while at both ends um, with uh, road debris blocking any transit, you know, in and out of the village. And we lost our water and sewage system for almost two weeks. And uh, the state didn't seem to know that we were without water for a while. Um, and, you know, I, I came here today with a, a set of thoughts and, uh, and I'm genuinely feeling a little bit scattered at the moment because there's so, so much to say. But maybe it's the heat. I don't know. 
but I'm feeling a little bit like the need to call out a little bit more directly what it is that we're seeing in this moment, right? Unfortunately, this year's flood, last year's flood, these are not the first disasters that I've had to respond to. I uh, ran a project in the Lower Ninth Ward after Hurricane Katrina for a very long period of time considering uh, how tiring that work can be. And that was almost 20 years ago, and I've responded to multiple disasters since. And, and with that perspective, I can tell you that I cannot, for the life of me, understand why it has taken Governor Scott so long to just request a disaster declaration. So let's just name that, right? These aren't abstract things that we're talking about. These are concrete things that have direct lines of accountability. And I feel like the Kool-Aid that, th that is being sold to the folks throughout the state that we need to gather data, we need to gather data, we need to gather, even in our own experience last year, by July 14th, we had a disaster declaration that unlocked federal resources, right? And nobody's waiting for the federal government to come and save us. That's not what I'm saying. But let's also call that out. That's our money. It's our money, right? And the, the trillions of dollars that we're able to find seemingly on a daily basis for imperialist wars, right? Why can't we rebuild our communities in safer, more flood, fire, and otherwise resilient ways? We have the funds. It's what we're choosing to do with them as a country. And I'm calling that out. And I'm also calling out the fact that the state of Vermont, we keep talking about the housing crisis. We keep talking about the housing crisis. We're putting people for millions of dollars in hotel rooms as some sort of like, you know, anything but actually address the housing crisis that just keeps getting worse, right? With each disaster, with more and more people getting displaced from their homes, with no thought of how to actually rebuild. But we can find $70 million to go build a new women's prison? Help me to understand, make it make sense. It the state of Vermont has chosen prisons as the response to the housing crisis. That's what their plan is. And I'm calling that out too, right? And I actually came here with a completely different message, but I, I'm feeling, maybe it's the heat, but kind of fed up, right? Kind of fed up. We as Cooperation Vermont have been working for the last year on a project to purchase the Goddard College campus and to decommodify that space, bring it back into the commons where it belongs under community control, and to create a resilience hub in that space. That is one small portion of the kinds of things that we need to be collectively working on, making plans for, and redirecting our funding that it is ours to actually implement local community-based solutions. We need to be fighting for more of our land in the state and throughout to be decommodified, to be brought back into the commons, and to be put to community purpose. And there's a, there's a bunch of different tools that we can use, community land trusts, using the village trust to bring key assets back into community control so they can be put to community purpose. But the, the more of this state that gets drained into second and third homes for estated properties with hundreds of acres of land while we continue to face housing crises, crises, sorry, and you know, no space for economic development work, right? Like we operate within a solidarity economics framework that is outside, it's a post-capitalist system right, where we're trying to look for ways that we can implement strategies that stop extracting from both people and the planet. And those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to just continue to implement amongst ourselves that you're right, the government ain't going to do it for us. But at the same time, we need to expose those contradictions and hold those who are accountable accountable. And I'm going to go get off my ankle now.
Thank you, Michelle, for that powerful word. Um, so we're going to have our co-director of Community Resilience um, Organization, Jessica Laporte, give an accounting of Megan Wayland in the Northeast Kingdom, who can be with us today, of some of the activities that are going on there. Hi, all. I'm going to start this by saying thank you to everyone who is here and who has been standing in the sun. Who knew that 930 in the morning was going to be this hot? So if you need shade, no shame. There are snacks, there's coffee. Um, bear with us. We, I'm going to speak and one other person. Um, oh. OK. Um, so Megan Whalen was on their way this morning. We got a first text being like, OK, I'm going to be a little bit late. And then another text being like, OK, 940. And then another text that just said, we can't get there. We've been driving for a couple of hours. And there aren't roads to get there. This is an incredible organizer up in the Northeast Kingdom, somebody who has been um, on the ground for over a year after last year's floods. But more importantly, Nico has been on the ground every day since they were founded, meeting the needs of folks who are forgotten by our systems. So we're grateful for their presence and the fact that they are out there. Um, and one of the things that Megan shared um, was a list of the things that they're going to do today. So bear with me. And for those of you who are in the middle of direct response, some of these are going to sound familiar. Find and pay for a record to pull a car out of a sinkhole that opened up in a family's front yard. Find and pay for a hotel room extend, uh, to extend hotel rooms for three families in Essex County, including one family that is first responders. An elderly veteran and another family with two small children. Text, utter, <laughs> text utterly devastating photos to a manager at the Chinon County Lowe's store so he can make a case that we need donations for tools and equipment. Connect with the leader of a local ATV association with volunteers and fire chiefs in Kirby and Lindaville so we can get out and deliver water and food to people who are stranded due to road washouts. Call Teresa in Island Pond to see if the roads are open so we can get supplies to the fire department. Call a donor back and tell them we need another $10,000. Who agrees that it's probably $100,000? Nico, like all of these small organizations, don't always have the funds to pay their staff to know that they can pay them a year out and they are the first responders in these disasters. So I'm pretty sure if that isn't Vermont Community Foundation, I'm gonna name them and I say 100K minimum per year for Nico. That's my demand. <laughs> um, update the canvassing maps. I'm gonna pause for the train. I can't multitask. <laughs> Okay. Update the canvassing maps to reflect the most recent damage data so we know where to send people um, and, uh, of our, on our canvassing teams. Train a canvassing team in Lindenville at 1 p.m. Run an online canvassing training at 7 p.m. Find a safe route from Lindenville to Montpelier for a press conference after more rain <laughs> and power outage last night. Didn't happen. Um, be articulate and passionate and charming and engage enough at the press conference. I'm sure Megan would have been. Um, I, I know that so many of the folks who actually showed up today, um, who are speaking, who lost homes, and who are a part of the response, none of these demands are new to your hearts and your minds. I know that you all are thinking about this all the time, and I hope that here today and moving forward, we can continue to connect to demand more and better from our state and our government. We deserve to be taken care of. And to all of you who have been taking care of your communities, you deserve rest too. The disaster will keep coming. Take good care. Find your support. <laughs> Reach out to community resilience organizations, and maybe we can be a drop in the bucket. <laughs> Thank you, Jess.
Our last speaker uh, this morning is going to be Lena Greenberg, also a co-director with us here at Community Resilience Organization, or CROWS. Um, Lena. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone for standing in the sun. I know everybody's tired for all the reasons to be tired. We're going to wrap up and just want to say, like, you've heard so much from the three of us because this organization is designed to be nimble. That's a gift. It's almost impossible to drop everything in disaster, which is why it's important to have institutions and organizations that are designed for this time, that are designed for the never-ending crisis that is now. As we've heard, the climate crisis is a crisis of home. It threatens our safety, not just on this planet, but on the roads that connect us to our communities, in apartment buildings that sit on the riverbank, and in town centers that bring us together. Even after the third or fourth or fifth major flooding event of this year, we still get offered a narrative that Vermonters are tough, that we're resilient, and we look out for each other. There is no doubt that that is the case. The way we show up for each other amid crisis is moving and powerful, but resilience is only possible when we have time to recover and heal. We will wear e each other out and we will wear our systems out when every single disaster hits the same way. It's already happening. Are you worn out? Yeah, you are. Expecting people to be perpetually resilient without meaningfully changing conditions that define our lives is not how we care for each other, and it's not how we create safety in home. We've heard that mucking out basements sucks, that people of all income levels don't have anywhere to go when they're displaced from homes. We've heard that folks in the Northeast Kingdom, a, a part of our state that is hailed as the most climate resilient place in the whole country, is also where most of the flood damaged homes in our state are. If we don't heed the lived experience uh -oh, and articulated needs of people on the ground, we will be squandering an opportunity to make our state a safe refuge as the climate crisis continues to un unfold. Making our state a safe home begins with passing policies like just cause eviction so renters can repair their homes, deduct the cost of those repairs from their rent, and not worry about getting evicted right after. It begins with repairing homes after disaster and preparing them to withstand the next disaster and the next one. It continues with building new climate resilient homes, not in the floodplain. It continues with sufficient administration at the state level to ensure that we're prepared when the waters rise and local volunteers and emergency responders have what they need to do their essential work. It continues with leadership in the state house from our governor, not just telling Vermonters to keep sticking together while failing to deliver concrete support, neglecting to establish long-term efforts and structures for disaster, and vetting and vetoing until programs are just a shell of what we need them to be. And we must manage our river corridors and floodplains and waterways like the climate crisis isn't going anywhere so that we make sure that that water has a place to go and that our infrastructure is able to withstand flooding events we know will just keep coming. The people closest to the problem, folks who had already lost everything before this year's July floods, folks who tried to buy flood insurance or get a FEMA buyout and were denied, folks who were too busy managing everyday crises to get prepared for acute disaster, and all the people on the ground who have been responding to this, that, and the other disaster today, yesterday, the last few weeks, these are the people closest to the solutions. The people's demands for a just recovery from flooding are the beginning of the work we need our state to do so that we can actually be ready for next time. Even better, the rolling crisis that is now is an invitation for us to not just address the damage done by flooding, but remedy the inequities that means some people always get hit harder than others. 
These demands have been endorsed by dozens of organizations across the state, fighting for civil rights, safe homes, thriving farms, education, ecological resilience, an end to incarceration, an end to systemic racism, and a swift recovery from disaster. The people behind the boldest and most liberatory visions of a thriving Vermont are behind these demands. This work will not happen overnight, and yet it must. There is already movement from last year's legislative session, conversations have begun, and policies have been passed. But the river doesn't care about busy schedules or bureaucratic slowdowns. We call on Governor Scott, state legislators, agencies, and officials to act with the urgency you feel when there's six feet of water in your basement, when you can kayak through the middle of town, and when you don't have a place to sleep. Now is a time for boldness and creativity, for moving beyond the invented limitations of our systems and meeting this crisis of home with solutions to make Vermont a safe home for the people who make this place vibrant and resilient. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lena. I wanna thank everybody for coming out this morning. Um, we are in a pivotal moment for addressing short-term needs and building towards long-term change. We'll be sending the people's demand to the governor um, and also to David Zuckerman, who were all invited today. Uh, we also invited the office of Bernie Sanders, Becca Ballant. Uh, these are the people who would not be where they are without our say-so. So we invite you uh, after to come inside with us to get an accounting for their not being here today. I am Sister Sankofa. I am change maker, reparations activist, equity strategist, and advocate for the people. These are my lovely co-directors, Jessica Laporte and Lena Greenberg. We stand in solidarity with the needs of you. And so um, I wanna say thank you again for being here. Um, love, light, peace. And tonight uh, there is a discussion conversation um, with a very good friend of mine from Empower Transformation, Ray Carter, uh, is here gonna be giving a discussion at the Savoy at 7 p.m. Um, the showing of The Forgotten. It's a film about the aftermath of the flood of 2023. So we hope that we will see you again this evening at the Savoy for the showing. Any questions? Should I take questions? Does anyone have any questions? We have an incredible list of signers onto the demands. If you've signed on, we'll be in touch. This is just the beginning. You know how it is after a disaster, you just gotta move quickly. So this is, this is our first step of many. It's tremendous to see the power of the organizations and the individuals who have signed on. Um, and there is, there is more work to come. We will, we will do as much as we can um, with, our, with our collective power. Thank you, everyone. And so just a reminder to sign on uh, as an individual or as an organi organization to the demands that are gonna be going around. If you have any questions, we're gonna stick around for a few minutes. I'm Sister Sankofa. This is Lena Greenberg and Jessica Laporte. Thank you for coming out today.